All right, so welcome everyone to Miami Champagne Week, day four. My name is Alessandra Steves. I uh, am the director of wine education for Florida Wine Academy and co-founder of Miami Champagne Week. This is the fifth year we are organizing Miami Champagne Week. And we had three days. So day one, we had natural champagne or biodynamic champagne. On day two, we had Peria Jouet. Uh, day three, we had um, Matt Citrilla, who's a master sommelier, talking about Munier. And today I have the great pleasure of welcoming Asi Avalin, Master of Wine, and Frederic Panayoti, Chef de Cave for Champagne Ruinart. So before we start, I just wanted to say that uh, we will record the session because I know some of you are um, not attending it. And also thank you for you know, the incredible registrations. We had people uh, registering from Canada, France, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Brazil, and here in the US, we have a lot of people from California, Texas, Virginia, New York, Connecticut, uh, Oregon, uh, Tennessee. So thank you so much. And of course, you know, the Floridians are here as well. So welcome everyone. I would like to introduce our two uh, guests today. So FC Avalon is Finland's first master of wine. She is uh, author of several books, including Asia Velen Champagne, which I have it right here. And she's the organizing, uh, organizer of Grand Champagne Helsinki. Mr. Frederick Panayotis is Chef de Cave, the cellar master for Champagne Ruinart since 2007. And Ruinart is one of the, or the oldest champagne houses in Champagne, founded in 1729. So without any further ado, welcome and let's enjoy uh, the Blanc de Blanc seminar. Yes, hello, uh, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to, to uh, share this uh, little uh, champagne moment with you, be it uh, the breakfast or, or a lunch champagne for you. Definitely pre-dinner aperitif for me here in, um, in Finland. Yeah, it feels a little bit bittersweet that as I was supposed to come there in person, but uh, I think that we'll make the most of this. And, and, and it's, a, it's a great um, program you've put together for the, um, uh, for the Miami Champagne Week. So when, uh, Alessandra, you uh, let me invite a special guest for my webinar, I instantly thought of uh, Frederick Panayotis. Um, for uh, several different reasons, uh, one of them being um, that I consider him to be one of uh, Champagne's best communicators. And he can do wine communication in how many languages, Fred? S seven? Not in, not in uh, Finnish, though, but uh, a few, right? Six, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. One day you can do it. Uh, but in any case, and I think also he's one of uh, technically Champagne's uh, best um, uh, best um, enologist, so I think uh, there won't be any technical questions left uh, un unanswered today. I'm relying on you, Fred, uh, for that, as I know that you know we have a lot of uh, <laughs> eager eager students here, master of wine students as well. So I guess we'll have some very interesting um, uh, topics to discuss. And I have chosen uh, three three in separate uh, like little bit topics because I think they will be interested interesting and uh, and uh, some of them are far too poorly known so first with something more more general we'll talk about Chardonnay in Champagne with the specialist uh, Renard but then after that uh, let's look into a bit of the magnum effect as we have Fred here to explain it to us and as well the the very topical question of the light strike which is completely unknown, I'd, I'd uh, dare to say, in, uh, in Champagne or, or in the world of sparkling wine. In Champagne, but, we know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, it's not communicated much. So it's, right. that's the I problem that the consumer, consumer doesn't know anything about it. So, um, so we'll shed some uh, light into it today as you've uh, done the wonderful initiative uh, of uh, protecting your bottles um, beautifully now. So I, I propose, Fred, uh, that we kick off instantly um, and start from the vineyards. Uh, so let's start talking about how is uh, Chardonnay to grow? What are its, its sort of uh, difficulties in the, in the climate of Champagne? And, and, um, and let's take it from, from then onwards. Well, um, thank you. Um, thank you, NC, and, and, and um, hello, everybody. 
Um, yeah, let's, let's um, go straight to the point. Um, two things about Chardonnay. Um, it, it's not a very difficult variety to grow, uh, particularly, but it's a very demanding variety. And, and that needs to be understood. Um, demanding in the sense that it doesn't thrive everywhere in Champagne. You know, when you speak about Champagne terroir, everybody thinks about chalk. The truth is uh, there is chalk and there is like, you know, a, a very uh, a big quantity of like, you know, uh, depth of chalk um, um, in most of the Champagne except the Aube region, which is a different uh, soil, it's Chimé region. Um, but uh, in many areas, the chalk is covered with some topsoil or even some alluvions. So Chardonnay is the variety that really needs to be on chalk. It does well on a few sandy area, but not so, there's not so many of them anyway. Um, so, so, so Chardonnay needs like the, combina the combination of chalk and I would say east or southeast exposure. And if you, uh, if you look at, and I think we will be looking at a map uh, later on, um, you will see that it, it's pretty much, uh, the Côte des Blancs is like ideal. Um, a, few, a few areas, a few patches of land in the Montagne de Reims. And then um, some area that might be not so well known to you, um, such as the Vitria, such as the Cézanne. There's also a, an area called Beru. And Mongu, of course, in the south of Champagne, that's the, you know, an island of, 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 of Chardonnay uh, in the Aube but there are not so many of like top areas to grow Chardonnay. Um, I would say that right now, Chardonnay uh, is about 31% of, uh, of the whole plantation. And it's, we've probably reached a limit. Um, although what we see more and more is people want to use Chardonnay more and more. And we see growers putting Chardonnay in some areas where maybe it won't give its best. So we will see how it develops in the future. But for me, Chardonnay needs to come from those terroirs combining chalk and southeast or east exposure. Having said that, um, Chardonnay tends to bud break early and that makes it very sensitive to uh, spring frost. And, and we've lost, 2003 was probably the worst loss we've ever had. Well, we lost 90% of the Chardonnay crop within, within one, two nights actually. Um, it is quite prone to uh, what we call milrandage or berry shutter. Um, because it's also early and it tends to uh, uh, flower a bit, a bit earlier when it's, it could be cold. Um, in terms of disease, let's see, Chardonnay is pretty sensitive to powdery mildew. That's not the hardest one to fight. Uh, we do well with sulfur uh, eventually, uh, but this downy mildew with the, with the drought and dry condition that we're having more and more is getting a bit more aggressive uh, when downy mildew uh, is, is way less aggressive now. That's kind of interesting. And as far as botrytis is concerned, I would say Chardonnay is probably less sensitive than Pinot Noir do and Meunier because we, we tend to harvest uh, Chardonnay earlier. Do you think that the, the climate change with the earlier springs, will that uh, pose more threats to, to Chardonnay in the future? Well, for spring frost, for sure, um, because you know we tend to have milder winters and bud break, uh, which used to be routinely like mid-April, is now more routinely late March. So that gives two more weeks of uh, spring frost exposure. So yes, we we will be more prone to uh, to spring frost damage potentially. The thing is with spring frost, it is rarely major. I mean, locally it can be devastating, and you you know you can lose 100% of your vineyard locally, but it it won't affect. 100% uh, of the Champagne area. So usually it is manageable, although locally it can be quite uh, damageable. Um, another element um, is uh, with the global warming is Chardonnay used to be the first variety to be picked up uh, back in the days. And even as, you know, as recently as five, six, or 10 years ago, uh, uh, Chardonnay, uh, when we follow the, the maturation process, uh, is always lace to start with, but it's the, it's the variety that has the steepest maturation curve, like it, 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 the, sh the sugar loading um, is faster in the Chardonnay variety. Don't ask me why, I don't think we know exactly why. Um, and so typically we would start our maturation process controls to see the Chardonnay being like late, you know, like you know, compared to uh, Meunier and Pinot Noir, but it would catch up. And typically in, this, in September, when we would harvest it in September, we would start with the Chardonnay. Recently, uh, and I think we will be showing some slides. Um, we've had uh, harvest taking place in August and Chardonnay has been harvested after 
Pinot Noir and Meunier. So that's something we need to explore. Uh, it seems like a, um, it seems like we need to learn a bit more about the uh, you know the maturation process of Chardonnay. So what you see on this slide, and I thought it's interesting to share with you guys. Um, I know that some people still uh, doubt about global warming, um, you know, in the world. Uh, well, uh, what, what we can see on this, on this uh, uh, change of temperature, so this is the average temperature in Champagne for the whole year between 1961 and 2019. Um, two things that you can see. First, um, there are variations, you know, some years can be warm, some years can be cold. So, so you have to look at the trend. You can't look at one year in particular because one year means nothing. Um, if you look at climate, you have to look at, at like 10 years average and then you get a picture. And what you can see here, if you, if you start to, uh, uh, to do like averages, you can see that uh, I would say since the 90s, uh, there, is, there is definitely uh, uh, like a higher temperature. We've gained 1.1 degrees Celsius. It doesn't, it doesn't seem much, but it is, it is a lot. And, and, and you can see that the last four or five years, particularly, uh, have been the warmest years ever recorded. And it also does translate, and you can move to the next slide. It does translate into harvest date. Uh, uh, look, uh, you know, uh, this is the number of days uh, between the flower and, uh, well, actually, this is the first day of harvest. Um, and you can see that, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s, routinely the harvest was taking place in September, going well into October, sometimes even starting in October. I remember when I was a child uh, harvesting at my grandparents, you know, late September was the norm. Well, um, since 2003, which was the first harvest in, taking place in August, since 1822, so there was none before that, uh, we've had seven, 11, and out of the past four years, we've had 17, 18, and 20. And 20 was actually the earliest harvest ever recorded in Champagne, uh, with people starting August 13. So, I mean, you can't deny, nobody can deny that in my region, uh, things are changing. And, and it means that probably the, uh, the composition of the berry uh, is also changing and we need to learn about it. What, what we see as a, as a consequence, as a result, is that um, there is more and more a discrepancy between um, what we call technological maturity, sugar levels, and physiological maturity, like balance between sugar and acidity, like uh, ripeness of the flavors, uh, enthusians and everything. And, and this is typically what you have in a, in a warm climate. So, so, know, the, so the whole growing season has become uh, distinctly shorter. Uh, what absolutely. does it mean? What does it mean for the for the for the wine? Can you make some well, generalizations? You know, you know, you know, I see that uh, uh, the, 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 in the world we've selected people have selected grape varieties that are typically used to be harvested between September 15 and October 15 because you want to get that hundred days more or less. One thing we believe is that it gives greater complexity. You know, when it takes time to ripen, when it's, the hanging time is long, there is, there is a greater complexity. So ultimately, I think we need to go back to these uh, 95 days. And last, this year we had 88 days. Last year we had 81 days or 80 days even, the shortest uh, season ever. Um, it means that we might lose complexity in the future. Uh, and, and so this, this, you know, we can't let it happen. So we need to rework in the vineyards, uh, playing with uh, different clones, maybe in the future playing with uh, other varieties, um, adjusting our um, trellising system. And I think we can really do a lot there to delay the ripening uh, season. You know, for so many years, we've been looking for the sunshine. We've been looking for the heat because we could not ripen every year. You know, you look at those harvests in October, some of them were absolutely disastrous. You know, 72, 74, 77, 84. You will see none of those vintages because they were catastrophic. Um, yeah, and, so, and the change has actually been very, very quick. I mean, the last 10 years has changed the whole. Now it's more fight for freshness and still 10 years ago, it was for, for ripeness. And, and you're raising a very valid point, Essie, because um, when you plant a vineyard, you don't plant it for five or 10 years. You plant it for, 30, 40, 50 years and more. And, and I think one of the difficulty we have now is, is, okay, we can probably do things right now, like, you know, uh, using clone that tends to be later ripening, uh, change, like putting our, our grapes higher, you know, not so close to the ground. But um, will it be enough? 
for what's going to be happening in 20 or 30 years, because we don't know how it will be in 20 or 30 years. So that's, that's the tough part about it. So are delay, you personally... No, delay warning cannot, cannot help much, you know, a couple of days, but, you know, not much. Are you personally in favor of developing these new varieties and, and is the LVMH, are you uh, doing as a company uh, research for it or is it Comité Champagne doing it? It's not allowed uh, to do, uh, to do uh, your own experiments uh, when it comes to new varieties. So it is absolutely done by the CIBC and uh, we of course supporting it because we can't let it, you know, like we can't do nothing about it. Um, but we, do, uh, we are experimenting with uh, clones that used to be disregarded, that now become interesting. And hopefully we have, uh, uh, we have a selection of uh, clones from the past that could be uh, interesting. Um, so, so those initiatives we do, you know, like experimenting with vineyards, a uh, new system, but this needs to be done in a, in a, in a, with the agreement of the INAO. What we're asking is that uh, we, we would like to have a few percent of our vineyards for, for everybody in Champagne where you can do experimentations. One, two, maybe 5%, I don't know. But I think we should be allowed to do some tests to, because, because the, the administration won't be fast enough. Mm, and Pinot right. Blanc is probably the worst variety to think of for that because it, is, uh, it ripens very early, very quickly. And, and I, th I don't think it can fit uh -huh. uh, the, this. Uh, Melier or Arban could be interesting in the future. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, we are now sort of thinking, considering all that uh, the champagne varieties are set in stone. But if, if you actually think of Chardonnay, it hasn't been uh, in champagne for such a long time, only like little over 150 years, which is not, um, not uh, much at all. But right. now it's um, still, um, I think in 1990, it was 1990s, it was uh, around 25% of the plantations. So yeah. it's, it's actually a relevant uh, newcomer. Uh, and if you think of Chardonnay as a house style, which is would your house style would be uh, described as a, as, as a Chardonnay um, style, um, it's even uh, younger. It would have all happened in the 20th century. Right. So I'd say that I'd say that Salon was probably the first house that made Champagne um, Chardonnay Champagne famous. But then when it comes to the house style, uh, Ruinart definitely was one of the uh, the first in the, in the sort of 1940s. Um, right. Maybe you want to um, talk a little bit about uh, how, how Chardonnay well, it's, was it's, chosen it's, as your... It, thank you, Essie. Yeah, it all goes to one man. You know, uh, I won't go through the, all the details of the history of the house, but basically uh, the house uh, had rough times between uh, uh, World War I until World War II. And at the end of World War II, we were on the brink of like disappearing. And, and the guy from the company, uh, from the Rinard family, uh, Mr. Bertrand Mur, who took over, is 26 years old, um, a lot of vision, and he's the one who decided to, you know, really focus on the Chardonnay uh, because he's ideal champagne. And at the time, as you say, Chardonnay was maybe even less than that, 20%. Everything was very fermented. There was much more Pinot Noir and Meunier. So you can imagine that the champagnes were on the heavier side, on the robust side. And, and his idea of champagne was it is best enjoyed from 9 a.m. in the morning until 9 a.m. the next morning. And I'm quoting the guy who I was looking to, uh, to meet a few years back. And so Chardonnay for I, him was I honest. think that uh, that uh, quote could equally well be uh, your, your quote. It suits, suits no, but your I'm, mouth. <laughs> he, he, he told it to me. You know, I met the guy, like I, I show where it is because it was right there um, in 2007 and eight and nine because he passed away in 2009. And I, I was always curious to ask him question, why did he do this and why did he do that? And the Chardonnay was, that was his, his answer was magical for me. And that's my vision of non-vintage champagne. Non-vintage champagne should be in, you know, enjoyed at any time of day and night. It should like, it needs to be refreshing. Okay, complex, um, uh, pure, has a lot of flavors, but at the same time, you know, very approachable in a way, you know, you know having this drink, like a high level of drinkability. And, and, that, may, and I see this vision. May I share with them my favorite quote from you, which is, uh, which is when, uh, when we were talking about, you know, how well does an uh, opened bottle of champagne keep? And your, your, your uh, uh, approach is that there is something wrong either with the wine or the company if you cannot finish a bottle. <laughs> That's right. So the, yes, the perfect drinkability uh, issue. So Fred, I propose we start tasting. Um, 
and to see what is the, the ultimate drinkable uh, wine style. And we have a few more questions about uh, climate change before we move on. So Michelle is asking if the night's temperature were changed as well, or is more about, you know, average nighttime and daytime temperature? Do you see the night temperatures increasing as well? I, I, I don't have uh, like super robust data on it, but what I, what I can tell you is during summertime, you know, it's, it's very different when you, when you ripen the grapes in summer compared to when you ripen them in September. The temperatures are different. Um, there is more light, there is more heat, even the nights, we can see the nights now are getting warm. And so um, uh, it's quite different. You know that, that um, temperature difference between day and night is a very important factor for the physiological maturation. This is well proven. That's why you don't find uh, some great varieties, like let's say, like in, in super hot climate where it's still warm at night, like let's say in North Africa. Don't, don't try to grow Pinot Noir in Morocco. It won't work. It won't even get like dark, you know, it will remain kind of green, even with alcohol levels super high. So you need this, this temperature difference between night and day. And of course, in the summer, it, you don't have them as great as in, as, in, as in September, you know, it's totally different. And Amanda is asking, um, since the grapes ripen more frequently year after year, we'll be seeing more vintage champagnes over non-vintage in the future? Uh, what we are seeing now is more vintage. I mean, we can basically make a vintage every year now, you know, if you want to, I mean, unless, you know, like, uh, like some very uh, rare years, but, but we have more choice now to make a vintage or not. So and in a way, it makes it even more interesting. You know, before you had to go for it if it was a good one, because you never knew when the next one was going, was going to be. Now, if you, can, you can pass it and say, okay, I make it next year. If I, don't, if I don't like the year, if it doesn't fit my side, it's fine. Some, some other people will do it, but I don't have to do it. And I know that next year I will probably do it anyway. Um, that's for now. In 20 years, I don't have the answer. But this, uh, this possibility to make vintages hasn't increased uh, uh, the, the making of them very much. I think that the vintage category is one that struggles quite a lot today. It's minimal. Oh, yes. It's like a little bit over 1% of the total of champagne. And exactly. people just don't really know what to do with the vintages, even if they are by far the, the best value for money category where you get uh, more, you know, better vintages, uh, better villages, longer aging, and the price difference to the non-vintage is actually quite minimal. So I, I would love to see more of that, but today's world seems to be so, so sort of black and white that it's either non-vintage or then prestige cuvee. We need your help. <laughs> yes. So, All right. Blanc uh, yeah, uh, let's, go ahead. Let's taste the Blanc de Blanc. Right. So, uh, maybe a few words about uh, grape provenance. Uh, we source grapes for this wine. We, we source grape from. Fred, Fred. I Fred, would say 25. Taste, let's, let's taste first and then show the map okay, and okay, discuss okay, in detail. Okay, I'm fine. very thirsty. Cheers, everyone. Keep this. That's in Finnish, by the way, guys. Santé, yeah. Thanks, Daniela. I see a few comments on this one. Yes, so on the... Um... On the nose, I think it's um, it's very. You can already um, smelling it. It's it smells like it's really crisp and crunchy. The fruit. It's very very fresh, um, fresh fruitiness. Uh, definitely on the white uh, fruit side. Um, uh, also green fruit, uh, I find. And then there is the Ruinart sort of hallmark, uh, smoky mineral um, uh, profile. Uh, coming probably from the, from the um, uh, reductive way of making, uh, making the wine. So right. those would be the, the first, um, first um, primary comments. But very approachable, nice and soft, inviting nose, um, I find. But very fresh, not much evolution um, there. That's, that's the, exactly the, uh, the idea behind this wine. And on the palate, if you think, if you compare this to most of the Blanc de Blanc, which would be very steely, very lean, sometimes very austere when they are young, 
this I find to be the opposite because it's it has volume on the palate, it has softness and, and a very, very uh, nice creamy mousse. So really, I'd say a very, very friendly style. Uh, I don't... Uh, I don't wonder that it has become such an incredible success story uh, commercially. And I've understood that you've worked really hard in the recent years um, with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, finding the right uh, ripeness level uh, for picking the Chardonnay. Not to have it vegetal and raw, but obviously not overripe as well. Maybe a few words on, on, on that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working hard on, on finding what it's, we have is, we're having a, like a big data approach on this. We're, we're um, like, you know, I, I'm rather analytical and I, and I like to make decisions based on facts. Uh, I, intuition is important, but you also need to back up with, uh, with like real data. And, and we're trying to, we've tried to identify what we call clusters uh, for grape, for the, for the profile, combining um, uh, sugar levels, acidity levels, and nitrogen. Nitrogen are very important in the juice and there's not much we can do about it. It's, it's heavily influenced by the way you grow the grapes. So you can play with that, but also the year and especially the dry year. Um, how as quickly you, does, if you move, move, change your way in the vineyard, how quickly does it alter the nitrogen level? Does it take like years uh, and years? It's, it's actually not much. It's actually more depending on the, on the vintage characteristic itself. I mean, you. You know, if you want to raise nitrogen, you could put nitrogen on the, on the leaves, like during the season, but it's not very efficient. It's not good because you're burning fuel to put nitrogen. So let's, you know, we don't want to do that. And it's not super efficient anyway. So there's, there's not much that parameter. We can't really play with it, uh, you yeah. know, like quickly. If you fertilize, you're going to increase the growth and uh, you're going to delay ripening. So it doesn't make sense either. So it, it, it's not that easy. But acidity and, and sugars, we can play more with that balance. So yeah, so we're working on on finding what we call the ideal balance for our style, which is not necessarily the ideal balance for other style. And, and, uh, and to be honest with you, there is a trend in Champagne now to grow for like super high level of maturity, way below, way above 11, 11 and a half, sometimes 12% alcohol. It doesn't work with us. We've tried. It does not give one that can make that style. If you maybe, if, have... you it, if you're looking for something very big, it could work, but not for that. So we need, we, we rather harvest at like, depending on the year. I mean, ideally 10.5% alcohol. In 2019, 11% was a sweet spot. But we have to reassess every year what we need to have. Yeah, I, I have found that in the last three years with the three rather warm and early years, many people have so changed talking about the ripeness that who were before pushing for maximum ripeness now realize that they actually have to, to work on the freshness rather than the ripeness. So exactly. Things go turn around very quickly. So I shall put now the, the, the map. Uh, we can uh, watch a little bit. Uh, where was the presentation? I think it was this. So, next, next slide, I think. Yes, I don't know why it doesn't want to, uh, uh, here. So yeah, this is, oh, this is an interesting map of, uh, uh, you probably haven't seen this one. It's made by, it was made by the CIVC. No one knows how to do it. It was like an intern who knew how to play with this. Uh, but this map shows you um, the real percentage of Chardonnay. So the more Chardonnay, the greener the area, like the more Chardonnay in percentage. So Côte des Blancs is, you know, nearly 100% planted with Chardonnay uh, out of 300, 200 hectares. So that's a little bit over 8,000 acres, uh, 7,000 acres, I'm sorry. And this is obviously the kingdom of Chardonnay with uh, six Grand Cru, but also uh, quite a bit of Premier Cru uh, in there. And we use, we use uh, you know, between, I would say, 30 and 40% of Côte de Blanc material uh, for the Blanc de Blanc uh, blend. The second region, which is a bit more dear to us because it's also uh, geographically uh, closer to Reims, is the Montagne de Reims. So, okay, it's obviously uh, uh, more planted with Pinot Noir especially, but there are some like uh, uh, patches of Chardonnay, especially uh, towards the east, the, the premier cru villages of villers marmerie Trépaille and Vaudemanche. And there is one Grand Cru, which is, you know, super dear. And when we come to Don Renard, it will be important, uh, which is called Sillery, the only Grand Cru in the Montagne de Reims or outside of the Côte des Blancs, actually, which has more Chardonnay than Pinot Noir. And those Chardonnay um, are a bit more structured, a bit more powerful, less finesse, 
but a bit more power. So they're, they're also very interesting and, and they also, you know, um, uh, go into these blends. And um, often you hear the winemakers say that they remind it Chardonnay that reminds a little bit of, uh, of Pinot Noir. Yeah. Because it has yeah, more I, structure. I, I like the comparison with Burgundy. I say they're more like Bone or Corton Charlemagne as opposed to Chassain or Puligny. You know, I think it, it's, uh, it's also a good comparison. And, and finally, you have those two regions uh, outside of those main areas, which is the Cézanne, more in the south. And Cézanne is like a replica of the Côte des Blancs. Honestly, it looks very much the same. Um, Vitria, a bit different, but, but those two areas are also super interesting. They make Chardonnay that tend to uh, be a bit more bold, uh, a bit, they ripen faster. And for non-vintage, they are critical. For me, I really, without them, I would not be able to make this wine. So for this one, uh, what would uh, a normal uh, blend be? How much would you have from, uh, you already mentioned Côte de Blancs, but how much from- Yeah, 30, 40%. I would say another, um, another 30% of Montagne de Reims and, and around 30, 35% of Cézanne and Vitria together. Plus there is, I, I didn't put everything there, but there can be uh, wines from the, the Massif de Saint-Thierry, so Chardonnay on sandy soils, but it's, it's minimum. And Mongue, I don't use it. There you know, it's been, it's too expensive to buy. People are crazy with Mongue, but good for them. Uh, right, so all yeah. together, 25 to 30 villages. Grand Cru, Premier Cru, and Regular Cru. What is actually, just if we uh, go uh, talking of grape prices, how would the Chardonnay be priced uh, in comparison to the, to the Pinot Noir? Uh, uh, depends where, uh, but there's often, in, in Grand Cru, it's about the same price. Uh, Premier Cru, I would say the same. But if you look at Cézanne and Vitria, it's way above uh, like 10%, something 15% more than the, than the Meunier or the Pinot Noir there. So, so it's, it's a highly prized variety. Uh, you know, this year there was in a way because of the low yield uh, allowed, um, there was uh, more grape than, uh, than what people could uh, actually uh, allow to use. Uh, but all the Chardonnay grapes found uh, a buyer. You know, and you, it's, it's, a, it's a variety in high demand. So you have to pay more for Chardonnay. And How much, uh, was there an increase again for this year well, in the price? Not this year. This year there was a slight decrease in price. Uh, I okay, was really for once. I think the decrease in price was like 5%, 4%. But don't get overexcited, you guys, uh, you buyers. It might not translate into a 4 or 5% decrease in price in three years from now. Yeah, I, I would be very surprised to see champagne prices go go down uh, for once. That hasn't happened much. So. And Frederick, uh, are you um, fermenting all the villages separately and then blending them? No. Not, not by region we do, not always by village. It depends how fast. The, the one thing we've seen with our uh, technique of winemaking, if, if, you, if you want to do like one specific cru, unless you have a tiny tank, if you have a larger tank, it might take two or three days to fill it up. If you want to say only, let's say, Le Menil and then Avis. Well, if you do so, uh, you, you add, you know, typically when you start getting juice, you want, to you want that juice to ferment quite quickly. Um, otherwise, you may expose your wine to uh, deviation. Um, if you reload, you understand, you start fermenting, the yeast are fermenting, the next day and the third, and, and like the day after even, you, you add more juice. So you, you are boosting the yeast again. And if you boost the yeast, they're gonna go crazy. They're gonna go crazy in population and they will reach a stage where there are too many yeast compared to the nitrogen that is available to eat. The nitrogen is kind of their food. And what, you were gonna, what you're gonna have as a result is typically a lot of reduction, which is not good. Um, Eventually, and this is something else we've seen, you, you can also have a lot of diacetyl production. Like uh, they, they are under stress and, and uh, they will produce more lactic flavors. And we don't want lactic flavors. I like lactic flavors on my bread in the morning sometimes, but not in my wine. I think it, it just hinders the fruit. You know, some people like it, it's fine. Um, but I think it takes away the purity of the fruit. And, and we want at Rina to stick to that primary fruit aromas. Absolutely. Shall we uh, try the Magnum to compare? Don't have to tell you, you twice. Talking to me, Amy. Um, <laughs> Essie. 
So I, I know that. Fact, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, important fact: the bottle you are trying is absolutely based on the ninety, on the nineteen, on the 20, 2017 harvest. Okay, with reserve wines, there was a question about it. About twenty-five percent reserve wine from uh, two thousand sixteen and two thousand fifteen. We, we use young reserve wines to preserve the freshness. Magnum, I checked, there should be sixteen base har um, uh, harvest, so they're, they're okay. typically one year older. I know that you are a huge advocate for magnums as well, for personal to, consumption and everything, so. All the way to call those bottles half magnums. Exactly. So let's... Uh, Mm, wow, so much uh, toast here. Somehow, very much the same. deep. A yeah, yeah, very much deeper uh, nose, uh, more nuances, definitely. More uh, also seems a little bit like positive evolution in the form of complexity. Exactly. Um, that's that's what I guess. That's what you expect to find in a magnum versus a bottle. There's a premium for it, and it should translate into more complexity. Uh, I mean, it's what you were saying is, is interesting. It's really the profile we expect. So you have less fruit. It's less straightforward, but there is more nuances. There is, uh, yeah, the toastiness is more obvious, uh, which is exactly what we want to show here. And just one year difference makes a big difference. Yeah, sometimes the magnums can be very smoky and super young, but here it's really ha has turned into a beautiful toast. It's, it's a very, very gorgeous um, nose. I don't know about you guys, but the one I have is perfect. So tasty. Aging Elevage for the Magnum is the same as uh, the Blanc de Blanc in regular format? No, it, aging is a bit longer. We typically have a nine months difference. No, so not one year. Would love to, but it's, it takes a lot of space. So we have typically nine, mo nine months more. So usually you have a year difference in the base wine compared between bottle and, and, and Magnum, but there are a few months where it's, this, it's the same base, but with more aging in the cellar for the Magnum anyway. I find that there's also a difference in the textural feeling, both that it seems sort of silkier, softer, and the, the mousse is even finer in this one. I have, yeah, I, I have uh, some like dry fruit, uh, you know, candied citrus fruit as well. Um, yeah, there is, there is also, as you say, like it's, it seems more integrated on the palate. Yeah, exactly. What glass do you recommend for Magnum? Uh, I'm, I'm using the same, but you could imagine using like a, you know, like a Zalto white wine glass, for instance, or like a, the uh, Lehman series made by, um, made by uh, Arnaud Lallemand at Classe Champenoise. You could, let's say, use number four for the Blanc de Blanc in bottle and use the number three for the Magnum. Yeah, and maybe, uh, maybe if we think of this, uh, the Lemon Grand Champagne, the, for instance, the Veuve Clicquot glass, which is a little bit bigger, or the, the, um, the what's the name of the Synergy, yeah. um, could be a nice, a nice to try as well. So what's with the what's with the magnum effect? I mean, we know that there is uh, there is uh, much less uh, oxygen compared to the to the volume of wine um, in the magnum. Does it explain it all? Well, it depends what we are talking with uh, oxygen. You know, uh, quite often there is uh, the concept of uh, uh, why magnums ages slower than a bottle um, is wrong. Um, a lot of people refer to oxygen in the, in the magnum or in the bottle as the LH. age. Um, this has nothing to do with it. LH age counts for nothing. Um, when the, ferment the second fermentation starts in the bottle, there is some oxygen dissolved uh, in the wine. And even there is some oxygen in the air, which is in the LH. age. But that oxygen will be consumed within a couple of days, you know? So, as soon as the fermentation starts in the, in the bottle, the second fermentation in the bottle starts, basically oxygen level is down to zero. 
So, and obviously at the same time, uh, carbon in gas in the bottle is going to increase in concentration up to, um, you know, reaching uh, six atmospheres or like 85 PSI um, at 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit. So once those bottles are in the cellar, they're, they're full of gas, full of carbon in gas, and they have no oxygen outside. There is no carbon dioxide, hopefully. I mean, there's 400 parts per million, but there is 21% of oxygen. So what's going to happen? I'm gonna take that bottle because the other ones are, are open. Is um, carbon gas is going to slowly escape. It's, we are talking about minimal amounts that are hard to measure, but they are, they've been confirmed. When oxygen is going to enter in the bottle. And that's sometimes hard to believe. Like I say, how can, how can oxygen enter when there is carbonic gas? But there are two different gases. You know, you have to look at physics, um, just physics, Henry Lo Henry's law, and, and it's easy to understand. So if you have zero and some high concentration, there is a gradient and it's gonna go inside. So the only place where this can happen is obviously around the neck of the bottle. And if your neck, if the, if the width of the neck is the same. They're actually not quite the same for the bottle and the magnum. There's a slight difference as we know. It's 26 millimeters and 29 millimeters. But you can make the calculation and it means that uh, over the time there will be, for the quantity of liquid inside, less oxygen entering the magnum as opposed to the bottle. So the evolution, because evolution is mostly about oxygen. Evolution is going to be slower, slower in a magnum versus a bottle. That's simply explained. And um, and um, I think that I've I've seen some studies where which show that uh, also the fermentation, the second fermentation, takes place at a different pace in a magnum. So starting a little bit later and lasting several days longer, because it has well, to somehow struggle I, with, I, the, with, be... with the oxygen. Uh, SEA, um, I'd be interested to see this, um, to, be, um, to be honest with you, I, I would be very interested. We, you know, it's funny, I had a conversation with my colleague uh, Vincent Chaperon uh, a few months ago about this, and, and, uh, and we're like, we were talking about it, and we think there's another effect, okay? Oxygen explains some things, but there could be something else, uh, and so we need to spend more investigation um, on, on this topic. So there, there could be they could be the magnum at cork tirage. No, 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 no. Magnums and uh, only the Jeroboam, Julia, uh, gets a cork tirage. But magnums have bottles, and bottles have the same type of uh, the same type of uh, uh, cron cap. By the way, same permeability, so they, they age the same. Yeah, and somebody was asking about uh, the um, if is the magnum from uh, refermented in the same bottle as it is uh, sold. And yeah, yes, yeah, it you, definitely has to be in champagne uh, from half bottle to the to the zero bomb. They must yes. be fermented in the bottle of um, sales. By the law, since 1997. So I think it's long been been understood the, that the the magnum is the best size or better size uh, for for a long um, you know keeping of uh, of champagne. But I think now confirm me if uh, if. Uh, I'm wrong, but I get the feeling that now uh, people more start to realize also the the um, the the, um, um, the excellence of the magnums, even if you open the bottle immediately. Well, I think we have great example here. For me, the, uh, the difference is, is uh, obvious, and for me, the preference is is for magnum. Somebody else might prefer something else, but uh, but do you see a a sort of um, rise in the demand for magnums? Well, when I joined Renard in 2007, I think we used to bottle about seven or eight percent of the whole production in magnums. And today it's between, uh, it depends on the, on, the, on the qualities, but it's like from 10 to 15 percent. So yes, we nearly doubled the max. Yeah, well, that's, that's great news. Um, while we are at this topic, why don't we talk um, talk about uh, the light strike a little bit? Because you have these highly vulnerable bottles with clear glass uh, um, on them, which actually give no pr uh, protection to light uh, whatsoever, and you get the so-called taste of light or good lumiere very quickly within within minutes or at least in hours, and it's a reversible uh, irreversible um, spoilage of wine. And I think that the, the biggest uh, problem of this uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, wine fault is um, that people have no idea what it is and what, what they should be tasting. They don't understand that it's a fault. It can come as it sometimes it's a bit like cabbage aroma. Sometimes it's very cheesy. Sometimes it's cardboardy. It can be even, um, it's something very pungent uh, and stinky, can be even like sewage-like. So it's very um, um, unpredictable and, uh, and, and happens uh, all the time with the clear glass bottles unless they are protected um, um, from the sun and even from, uh, from, um, from regular lights. So I, I, you have, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see a very good point. Um, I, I, I wanna add something. Don't think that only clear uh, glass bottles are going to be affected. Actually, maybe we'll see with the slides, but that's a, that's a wrong assumption. It goes faster with clear glass because there is less protection, but apart from the super dark bottles, all other wines will be affected. And so when I, I have to say, and I, I'm probably there is some summary around here. When I see those newly, uh, these new restaurants with like huge display of, uh, of wines with bright spots, which I understand uh, can help sell them. Be aware that all of your white wines in not so dark bottles, you know, like the Coche du Rie Burgundy, those uh, wines that stay quite a long time, maybe the Coche du Rie doesn't stay so long, depends on the price, but they might be affected. And, and, uh, and, and that's not good, you know? Uh, red wines, way less, uh, maybe not. We, we, uh, I don't investigate on red wines, but white wines for sure. And they don't have to be in clear glass. So, so be careful guys, because uh, what you have there is not good for the wine, you know? There's a reason why bottles were stored in cellars in the dark in the past. Sometimes we should look back at what, you know, what we've done, what people were doing, because there was a reason behind it. And I think that uh, the problem has, and it's actually all the time multiplying uh, because of the success of, uh, of certain wines like yours and say Cristal, they are so desirable, they look so delicious in their uh, clear glass bottle that, that many producers all the time are copying um, this, uh, this type of presentation, especially for the Blanc de Blanc and for the Rosé. So therefore, I think it's really the time to open the eyes to this problem and, and uh, if the producers want to keep on producing them, because I know that uh, that uh, you have to because it's commercially so successful, also a little bit because of the packaging, uh, that uh, we must also communicate uh, the problems that come with it. For sure. But um, so I don't know if we're going to go some sides. You know, you know, the, the, let's you go know which, through the slides. Uh, Essie, do you know which, which product was first affected by um, uh, light struck in, the, in like in history? No, no. No, something me. actually, which is in a way very American for me. Like you see it in the American movies in the 40s and from the 40s and the 50s. You know, there was, there used to be a delivery man who used to bring the milk in the morning. Ah, uh, milk, it, yeah, And yeah, put it on the door. Sure. Well, milk yeah. in the clear glass and sun does not do well. It's, it, it also can be affected by light struck. And so does olive oil, so does beer. Uh, so there, there's a few other products that, that are also very, very sensitive to light struck. We have a question that can carbon dioxide protect? Absolutely not. Same thing, carbon dioxide, by the way, does not protect from oxidation. You know, you see now this trend with like uh, some like wines with a bit of, uh, like steel wines with a bit of uh, frizzante, like a bit of gas. People say it's, it's a better protection for oxidation. It's not the same gas, it doesn't work. I think it's a matter of proteins. Well, we'll see. It's actually amino acids and, uh, and vitamin, but uh, we can see more details about it. So if you want to know what's behind light strike, uh, you may want to switch to this part, um, uh, SE. 47, actually 41 now, we found a 41. That's for Don now. we come back to that later, maybe. Yeah, sorry, okay. it's at the end of the presentation. So yeah, yeah, go, to... go, move, move, move. Okay, so uh, first you have to know what light is about. So light is made, is made of what we call photons. Photons are uh, way less uh, invisible particles, uh, but they carry, the, they carry the light. And light can be divided into like different, uh, different zones, you know, from X-rays to uh, like, you have three different types of UVs and you have the visible light. That's the one that we can see us humans. Uh, and actually beyond or above visible, you have infrareds that warm you up. Okay, so um, 
once you understand this, um, you can have an idea. And uh, by the way, I like the guy in Florida. He's a Russian guy, Russian chef, but he's, uh, he's surfing in Florida with a bottle of Blanc de Blanc. And I think this Blanc de Blanc bottle is light struck. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> this guy is very cool. Cool chef from uh, Moscow. Okay, so this is, this is uh, 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 the culprit here. Um, it all starts because of a, a, a compound that is obviously naturally uh, formed in wine. It's called riboflavin or vitamin B2. Huh? Uh, it's, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's present in every wine. And this, uh, this vitamin uh, reacts, it can be affected uh, by two different wavelengths. And you can see them here, 370 nanometers. And those, that is in the ultraviolet and 440 nanometers. So this is uh, in the visible uh, spectrum and more precisely in the blue spectrum, okay? And I want to insist on this because quite often people will tell you, oh, I have UV protection. Like my, my doors are UV protected. These um, spotlights don't produce any UV. But that's only half of the problem. It's like doing this, you know, and, and think you, can, you can't see anything. It's completely wrong. So you're just going twice as slow, but you're going there anyway. And, and, and it's so, the, it seems to be that also the, the traditional method, uh, sparkling wines are even at a bigger risk than an, a normal white wine in, in bottle or right. rosé wine. Why, why is that? More generally because, um, and that's the next slide, maybe, uh, Essie. Uh, riboflavin, that vitamin, will react with two amino acids. You see them on the left. Uh, those two amino acids, among the 21 amino acids, are the only one that have a sulfur uh, compound in them. So they are called cysteine and methionine. And, and uh, they're the only one which are going to react once the riboflavin is activated, is actually uh, reduced by the light, and they will be transformed into those nasty sulfury compounds uh, with uh, very sexy names, such as hydrogen sulfide, uh, methanthiol, dimethyl, um, dimethyl uh, disyl, there's two of them actually, disulfide, yes. Uh, and all of them, um, can remind you of like a rot, rotten egg, cabbage, as you mentioned. For me, uh, I see the best description is like those, um, those flowers that you forgot in a vase for too long when the mm. stems start to uh, like, you know, become like uh, almost liquid. That's, that's exactly what it smells like. Yeah. yeah. So sure. why, why, sh why sparkling wines or Metho Champenoise wine um, tend to be more prone? Because the, the second fermentation produces more of those uh, as amino acids, typically. And so there is more material, there is more um, substrate to start with to create those aromas. And Frederick, how, how much time under the sunlight or under artificial light does the wine have to be to, to have this? It depends, it depends on, uh, on the intensity. So sunlight, Depends where you are. Uh, one example, if you go up in the mountain, if you go to, uh, let's see, Telluride or, uh, or uh, you know, one of these uh, fancy uh, ski resort, Aspen or whatever, there is no protection from the, from, the, from the sky. And so it will take as little as 15 minutes in a bottle, as little as 30 seconds in a glass to start being able to smell them. Artificial light, it depends on the intensity of the light and it depends on the, um, of the uh, spectrum of that light. So this is why in Champagne, in our cellars, we exclusively use those yellow orange lights. They're called monochromatic lights and they emit at a, at a very specific uh, wavelength, typically at 660. And that's why, and, and this is the only type of light that you should allow in your cellar. Because again, it will be faster for clear bottles, but, but for regular green bottles, it will happen as well, slowly but surely. 
So you have come up just recently with this beautiful, beautiful uh, um, response to this, uh, this issue. I'm so proud of this. This to me is the packaging innovation of the year or, or the decade even. I think this is brilliant. Well, I see the, the idea was to uh, kill two birds with one stone uh, to start with. Um, we wanted to protect the wine and at the same time we wanted to get rid of i mean we wanted to make something for the planet because it is little known but uh in our industry the 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 biggest uh influence or the biggest factor in emitting green gases um is in the packaging and in its transportation vineyards wine making account for 10, 15% maximum. Packaging and transportation altogether um, is two thirds. So you can be as, you know, you, can, you need to be good everywhere, but a small impact in packaging will have a much greater influence on, um, you know, on your green gases emissions. And so the idea was as much as lovely as this box was, and protected and already quite uh, well conceived. It's, it's purely cardboard, there's no plastic here. We came up with what you see on the picture. That's, that's going to replace the gift box. In the US, it will come next year. It's not here in the US, but in Europe, uh, we are launching it this month. It is nine times lighter, 60% uh, less uh, green gases emissions, and entirely recyclable, compostable. So this is our answer. And of course, it does protect the wine from light strike. So I'm happy that you like it, uh, Essie, because I couldn't wait. And you know how much I was pushing <laughs> to get the protection. Uh, as a winemaker, I was thrown between the beauty of the bottle, you know, it's very appealing, yet I knew that uh, it was not protected. We've done our job here within in the cellar, and maybe you've seen it. Um, I would say since now uh, probably eight years, I am 100% sure that none of the bottle that gets out of here has been affected. They all taste perfect. But once they're in the market, once they are displayed, no guarantee, of course. And this will finally guarantee that the Blanc de Blanc uh, remains perfect all the way to the end until it is consumed. Yeah, I think that's really brilliant and it still, you know, communicates the same uh, desirable, uh, delicious image. I think it's really brilliant and, uh, and uh, yeah, just all, all, all the way so perfectly done. Uh, this uh, sort of raises the question to me that uh, are you going to do a similar thing to the Domroinar? Well, I, Because, okay. you know, I think that we still have the fashion for this really heavy, expensive uh, packaging for the Prestige Cube. But now that I know that you are very, uh, very sustainably uh, minded at Rönart, and I'd like you to do something uh, similar, very light and very ecological for the Dom Rönart as well. Okay, well, I will answer that question later. But yes, I mean, the question that just appeared now. Um, um, yes, we are, as, as, you, as you know, since 2010, we've, we've changed, uh, since vintage 2010 Dom Rönart, we've changed the aging with the cork instead of a cron cap. So when this vintage hits the market in 2022, we will change the packaging a little bit. And um, we are actually working, it's work in progress, SE. But yes, I believe that those gift boxes are dead. You know, um, we, we had a study recently that um, gift box, the lifetime, the life expectancy of a, of a gift box, once it's been purchased, is 15 minutes. What a waste, honestly. And you guys, I'm sure that if you work in restaurants and you receive those beautiful cuvee with like these big boxes, you don't know what to do with these damn boxes. You know, you throw them away. It's like they've taken space. Hopefully you recycle all of them. That, that I expect from you guys. Um, but, but even if you do so, it's still waste. So, you know, I, I think that in four or five years from now, from now, we'll be looking at gift boxes like, what, what were we thinking? You know, how could we do this in the past? And so, yes, there will be something for Dorwin R. Still work in progress. That's, I can't yeah. talk about it, but it's, it, there will be something. 
And why I'm, don't we taste taste Dom Ruinard as well? Yes. Uh, we, we. Yeah, I, I had a question about the sleeve. So how long did it take for you guys to come with the solution? And you know, um, is um, how how is the cost for this? Because it is super beautiful and pretty. So you know, I can't wait to have this in the U.S. Uh, for all of us. But how long was the research and development of this? Because two years. Uh, seven prototypes to finally, you know, it, it looks easy to make because it's only made from a, a, a paper, you know, paper fibers from a, a, a eco uh, managed forest from Northern Europe. Uh, it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's made in a very, very friendly way um, in, a, in an amazing facility. Um, but it, it, what, sim what looks simple is sometimes very difficult to make. And, and like the cutting with like uh, water, uh, you know, we cut with the water, not with like uh, other systems. And so the design, the closing was like the biggest thing that we have to, uh, you know, the biggest challenge was the closing. Uh, so it took us two years and seven prototypes at the end. And I was very impressed uh, to hear that you didn't patent this, uh, this uh, packaging, that instead you actually want to encourage others to, to do something similar. That Absolutely. I think is great attitude. And, and we've seen a high interest already from the perfume industry, obviously within the group. And uh, I hope that other people in the, in the wine business will, uh, you know, will follow us. You know, exactly. We want more people to move. You know, we, I think it's, and you will see, you know, when we look back, we'll see like, we should have done this sooner actually. There's a, there's a question about can this uh, packaging um, stay in the refrigerator, but I think you've done even better than that with its yeah, we, capacity. Three hours in a nice bucket, no problem. And I've been reusing mine for like several times. Yeah. Uh, refrigerator, no problem. Cellar, if your cellar is musty and, um, and, and kind of, you know, dump, it will, like any, like cardboard, it will be eaten alive by the, uh, by the fungi. So, I wouldn't use it in a, in a, you know, in a cellar, you gotta be having a dry cellar. Yes, so um, uh, Kimberly was asking that how long has light strike been a concern? Is it just newly understood? Uh, lights in Champagne, uh, it's been a concern since supermarkets have been selling Champagne in the early 1970s. And actually I very well know the lady who did the first thesis on uh, this problem because before that there was no supermarket in the 70s in France not in the US of course but in France it was completely new and people started to display their bottles um, on the on the shelves and they clearly realized that something was wrong and so they, they identified early on what was the, the reason and they started to coat the bottles with a special protection and make them darker so that light struck would not completely avoid it, but would take time to develop. So we, it's a well-known phenomenon. And in the beer industry, even more, you know, they, they started earlier in the beer. Beer has the same problem, and this is exactly why you don't have any um, artisanal beer in clear glass. Only industrial beer can be in clear glass, because with the beer industry, they have something they can, they can destroy the, the component that are uh, that will be uh, um, affected by the, this, this vitamin, you can, you can crack them, you know, literally crack them with a, with a special treatment. In wine, we can't do it. So for beer, they have an answer for clear glass. We don't have it. Right, shall we taste the Dom Renard? I'll put the slide on which presents it. Let me just... So Dom Renard. Well, you know what? I know there's a lot of uh, um, friends in America and uh, just a little bit of history. This, this cuvee was born in 1959. And, and by the way, at the time, uh, Reyna was still a fully independent and, and, and family house. And in my opinion, it was uh, like, a you know, they were targeting Dom Perignon because this monk was already more famous than our monk. But we had a monk we have a monk at Ruinard. He's the one who uh, uh, probably uh, uh, inspired uh, Claude Ruinard to start this company in 1729. So 1959, the decision was made uh, by Bertrand Mur to uh, create that, uh, that very first vintage of Don Ruinard using 100% Chardonnay grapes. It was basically, he transformed the vintage Blanc de Blanc into Don Ruinard. Um, 
maybe being more strict about great provenance. And, and what you can see on the right is the advertising uh, that was used in 1966. And, and I love how he says it. America, you only have like, you have all those uh, uh, 1300 cases, you know, but this is all we have. And I think it's lovely. And, and, and a little bit of history again there. I was, since I joined RINA, um, when I joined, there was no bottle of 1959 left in the cellar. And I started that search. Like everywhere I, was, I would go, I would ask for a bottle. And I finally found one uh, in Los Angeles, uh, a lovely guy, uh, Math Kenner, who has three uh, um, restaurants, wine bars in, in LA, who uh, upon purchasing a cellar from a, um, a family in New York, found a bottle of 1959 in pristine conditions. And, and he kindly, kindly uh, gave it to the house. So we now have one good bottle of Don Renard 1959 at home. I haven't opened it yet, so I don't know how, what it tastes like. Are you going to open it or do you, are you going to leave it to your... Uh, I, as long as I only have one, I will not open it. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's why I'm looking for a second one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you must, uh, must be able to taste it. So yes, so um, completely different nose. Uh, it's um, the what comes to my mind is uh, it's very uh, Burgundian. It's very complex, uh, evolving. Um, I haven't tasted it. I, I just smelled the wine um, so far. Even this sort of um, buttery, you know, in a very positive way, buttery right. complexity to the nose. It's more like, for me, it's, it's, it's I, I like to use the word, uh, you know that cake uh, called Paris Brest in France? Yes. It's, it's like hazelnut cream, super light, fluffy with like a, with like a shoe, like a, like a cheese, like a puff on it. And for me, that's what uh, often that Dorina evokes me. So it has this kind of a super light creaminess with uh, the toasty or roasted uh, dry fruits uh, with it. So here, your recipe is quite, uh, quite unusual for, for a Prestige Cuvée Blanc de Blanc. Most of them would be um, uh, Côte de Blanc, uh, Grand Cru only. So you come up with a diff completely different concept. Why is that? Well, it's just geographics, you know. If you can move to the map, maybe. Um, so the idea with this wine from the beginning was to use, uh, was to use Grand Cru vineyards. Uh, it's, I think, the other way around, um, SE. Um, and, Sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, a little bit further, I think. So which one do you want? No, no, the one with the Don Ruinard, because the, we will show the villages. Ah, right, yes. So the, the, idea, the idea has been to use Grand Cru, and so there's, this is like a super old map from, from actually uh, uh, 17... Uh, 47. And uh, you can see the Côte de Blanc on the left. And of course, you know, Côte de Blanc is the kingdom of Champagne. And we are happily using Chouilly, um, Avis. Uh, there's a little bit of Auger, not every year, but there is some Auger in this particular vintage 07. And then Le Ménil sur Auger. Those are, you know, some of the best vineyards of the Côte de Blanc. But geographically, we are very close uh, to, to uh, the Montagne de Reims, more than the Côte de Blanc. And back in the days, uh, uh, it, it took forever to get grapes from the Côte de Blanc when you were in Reims. So, so we've been sourcing and we've been buying vineyards um, closer to our, our cellar in Reims. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the one village that is quite unique in the Montagne de Reims is Sillery, where, if I'm not mistaken, uh, out of 95 hectares planted, 67, 65 hectares are Chardonnay, which makes it very unique. And, and nearby, the villages of Puisieux, small Grand Cru, huh, only 16 hectares, Verzenay and Mailly, they also have a little bit of Chardonnay. And we've been using those Chardonnay uh, since the beginning to craft Don Rinard because, because they bring something different, you know, and we, and we love those Chardonnay as well. As I mentioned, um, if you compare to Burgundy, for me, Côte de Blanc would be either Chablis, when, you, when I think of Le Ménil, but more Chassain, Merceau, or, or Puligny, when I think of the other villages. If you go to the Montagne de Reims, it's definitely more like Beaune Premier Cru Blanc, or like Corton Charlemagne, you know, more 
more austere, uh, more structure, less gentle, but with amazing aging potential. So the blend is actually, I think it's not a bad idea. It works quite well. And I it's always like, find that th there's like this degree of venosity, especially yeah. with the, over time in the, in the um, Dom Renard, much more than in the Cote de Blanc uh, versions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Al although I would say in terms of venosity, Aviz can really help with that. I think Aviz is one, is the Grand Cru in the Cote de Blanc that probably shows most of it. And, and maybe, so 75% Cote de Blanc, 25% uh, Montagne de Reims for this wine. Full malolactic, but as you probably will see, there's very little trace of that heavy, buttery, creamy aromas. Um, this bottle, you have the disgorgement date on the back. So mine was disgorged in February 2019. So it stayed, uh, you know, eight years on the lease. Um, dosage is obviously quite low. Huh? It's extra brut level, even if it's not mentioned, but it is extra brut. Um, and, and what else I wanted to add? Um, about uh, about this wine, I forgot actually. No wonder that I have more battery tones. Mine was disgorged in November 17. Ah, so I have you. a really early early disgorgement. So ah, you have perfect. one of the earliest disgorgement, if not the earliest disgorgement. Yeah, probably. And uh, yeah, just have to mention about this wine that it's it's special to Fred also because it was your first uh, oh, yeah. Dom Ruinart, wasn't it? And, well, what uh, I was going it, to mention is, is not that it was my first uh, uh, <laughs> but more importantly, 2007 is, is a kind of um, uh, overlooked year. Uh, Pinot Noir and Meunier were quite difficult in, in 07. There was some botrytis, but we harvested the Chardonnay early on. Uh, not, a, not a super high level of maturity, but, but a good balance between uh, sugar and acidity. And it's an, honestly, it is an excellent year for Chardonnay. And, and I'm gonna mention my colleagues from uh, uh, Tétanger with Comte de Champagne, my colleagues at Salon, uh, my colleagues at Charles Heitzig, it's not been released yet, but it will be in the future. My friend growers in the Côte des Blancs, Agrapar, Peters, they made amazing, amazing 07 Blanc de Blanc. And believe me, this one will age very, very well. But it was very brave of you to do this, the already a Dom Ruinart on your first vintage, plus a, a, from a vintage that wasn't, uh, wasn't like universally hyped. It was uh, quite challenging for Pinot Noir, actually. It's the rookie luck, you know? <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. And uh, you've also um, done the decision to, to start using, using um, uh, natural cork uh, for, for the uh, second fermentation for Dom Ruinart. Tell us right. about why, why that. Well, um, my, my predecessor started to experiment uh, the difference between bottling with a cork versus a crown cap because they knew that, I mean, you know, there were um, other producers also using it. And, 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 and the, the, the consensus with that, uh, with the cork, contrary to what we could initially think, aging is slower aging is more reductive. And, and since that's our style, uh, and after seeing the evolution of the wines, I was convinced that it was a, you know, like a game changer, like making, a, like pushing Don Renard to another level. And um, SC, you've tried the Don Renard La Reserve 98. It's a very limited oh, yes. day, not available in the US, unfortunately, uh, because it's super limited and complicated to uh, sometimes to uh, sell uh, all over the world. But if you compare this, um, so we started to experiment in 98. We, we, there were 2,000 bottles of uh, Don Winner 98 on the court versus the rest. And, and we've kept those bottles. And believe me, when you try them today, it's night and day, night and day. And, and those bottles on the court are even more Burgundian than the bottles on the crown cap. And you know what? I love Rouleau, I love Bachelet, <laughs> I love Coche Dury, I love, uh, you know, uh, Comte Lafont. And um, I think it won't hurt if Dorwin is getting closer to these amazing wines. So that's the plan. And you have to be patient because 2010 will be uh, released in 2022. But um, I think it's very promising. Absolutely. 
Do we have, uh, um, Alessandra, have we missed a lot of uh, questions? Probably yes. Yeah, we, we at least we were asked about food uh, food pairings for these uh, three wines. Uh, uh, I must say that uh, the Ruinat Blanc de Blanc is my my regular uh, wine for when I when I eat uh, crayfish. We have this uh, crayfish oh, right. parties, uh, very famous uh, here in in the Scandinavian Amazing. countries. Amazing in Finland. Amazing. Yes, yes. And, I uh, saw your just... Instagram. Yeah. I, see, I was like salivating seeing all this crayfish. <laughs> Yeah, but it's I find it really to be perfect with seafood, like the just like a seafood platter type of right. thing, the purest uh, purest seafood, uh, because there is this sort of lovely sweetness to the wine and the purity, and to me it's the perfect uh, match with uh, with very sort of um, pure seafood um, dishes. What else do you normally recommend uh, well, to them? I, I love the uh, white fish sashimi or white fish crudo in Italian style with like a beautiful olive oil, works very well as well. Uh, tempura, I think is a great match as well. Something crisp, clean, bright, as you mentioned, crayfish is amazing. One thing I don't so much like um, to, to be paired with our Blanc de Blanc is oysters. I think it's mm. too salty, briny, too much our wine. It's not big enough to, I don't think any champagne can match oysters anyway. Um, goat cheese, very, very interesting. Goat cheese works quite well with, uh, with Blanc de Blanc. So thin, crisp, clean, bright, you know, delightful, and it works, basically. And uh, with the with the Dom Ruinart, of course, the pairings are, are sort of uh, limitless. I mean, it's such a gastronomic uh, wine. What are your favorite uh, combinations with it? Well, well, as a tribute to Mr. Mr. Muir, here in, in Reims, at, at our, um, at our um, facility, at our hospitality center, we like to serve turbo. So it's just grilled turbo, uh, uh, you know, just like, like on the pan uh, with a beautiful texture with a cream of cauliflower and some like uh, gently poached cauliflower as well and, and a champagne sauce, of course. You know, we, we can use as much as we want. But that works quite well. Right now, um, it's the season of scallops just starting now in, in, in France and caramelized scallops. Um, you can think of, you know, like uh, sides around, uh, but, but, you know, many, many, you know, many things are possible, but caramelized scallops and Dominar is like a wonderful treat. Absolutely. Beautiful. So uh, I will go back to a few questions. Um, so Nancy uh, asked to explain the difference in the base wine between the Magno and the regular bottle. As I mentioned, um, so I think we talked about it, but okay, we will repeat, no problem. Uh, the bottle would be 17 base. And the Magnum, I'm sure all of you have 16 base, if not older, depending on the stock you had. But typically we age the Magnum one more year, nearly one more year. So you would find on the market a year difference. So one year is not much, but it makes a difference. And Justo asks if you, Frederick, has written any book about champagne. I guess we are all impressed with your knowledge. No, I think Essie is a better writer than I am. I'm <laughs> I leave it to people who know how to write. Yeah. Yes, Ashley, yes. Where can we find your, your book in the U.S.? Yeah, we can only find it through the Florida Wine Academy. <laughs> You're sold out. We need more. You have to send us yes. a container. This is, honestly, this is a benchmark book on champagne. It's amazing. It's so complete of information. It's you know, super well written. And, and, and honestly, I mean, I know quite a few people who are, uh, who claim to be champagne experts, but SE is on top of it. And I'm not saying this because you're here. I mean, I've known you for years. You're an amazing taster on top of it. So thank you very much. You know your stuff. Thank you. Good. Well, lovely. If if um, um, if um, no other questions arise, I think it's it's time to sadly close the the Miami Champagne Week, isn't it, Alessandra? That's a good way of closing it. Indeed, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. And next next year, hopefully live, we can do this together. Absolutely. Thanks, so, yes. if people are asking about the books, um, send me an email later and we'll chat yes. with Cassie if she can send some books to the US and Canada. Um, so again, thank you very much. This was a, our final event for Miami Champagne Week. It is Friday afternoon in Miami, we have, you know, 30 Celsius, 90 Fahrenheit. So oh my guess, God. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. So I guess for the people who open the bottles, you know, you have a great weekend. I know about it. And I will, you know, 
uh, would like to thank Asti very much for your, your time, your knowledge, and Frederick, this was amazing. I have written, you know, four pages of facts in here, so it was very informational as well, so thank you so much. Cheers. Thank Lovely. you, guys. Thank Thanks you very you much. Again. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers guys. everyone. Cheers. Happy champagne week. Should be, every week should be a champagne week. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right. Happy Friday. Cheers, guys. <laughs>